Good afternoon. Um, it's been fascinating this morning to, to hear from the, the speakers, and we thought we'd like to kind of really round up the, the afternoon's um, session uh, by kind of doing a review, giving some practical examples, uh, and leading us into the discussion groups. Um, so I just want to start by introducing and um, really kind of putting into context where our school buildings and our school thinking in terms of spaces, um, where we currently are and where it kind of puts us for the future. So we have this as a, as a quote, which I think is really interesting about the fact that, um, you know, we don't know what our students face in the future, which is very much really picking up on what, what Erica was saying earlier. Um, so how do we then think about the buildings and design buildings to allow our girls to, to really kind of encompass that and take that forward. Um, so a few thoughts really. Um, I think it's fair to say that learning is changing in the 21st century. Um, technologies used in learning such as interactive whiteboards, personal learning environments, wireless networks and mobile devices, plus the internet and high quality digital learning resources, and the ability to access many of these from the home, from the school and from the workplace are altering the experiences and aspirations of learners. Increasing investment in the state and learning technologies, combined with the need for more cost-effective space utilisation, is making it increasingly important for heads and for decision makers in schools to keep abreast of new thinking and about the design of technology-rich learning spaces. And speaking as an architect by profession, um, it's incredibly important for us from the quality of brief that we're given. You know, an architect is only as good as the brief that they're given. So if you ask for 10 boxes connected by a corridor, you'll kind of get 10 boxes connected by a corridor. It may look pretty, but that's what it will be. What we need is the educationists to really kind of drive the, the design of buildings forward. So understanding what makes an effective design is important. The best are likely to assist all within school to work more productively and to produce learners who are confident adaptable, independent, and above all, inspired to learn. In short, the design of our learning spaces should become a physical representation of the school's vision and strategy for learning. And that's where it really comes into the schools to, to really drive that brief and to drive that vision. So responsive, inclusive, and supportive um, spaces, which enable attainment by all, is incredibly important in how we think about the brief. Spaces should add value to learning and act as a teaching assistant to learning activities. School buildings need to be viewed as influences of future practice, not responsive to existing practice of teaching and learning. I'd just like to hand over now to Kevin. You are coming back, folks. I'm coming back, yes. <laughs> um, it strikes me that the, the one big take-home point for me so far has been that it's a great privilege and opportunity to speak after Erica but not immediately after that. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're, we're all built into the, we're, we're all bought into the premise that school design plays a crucial role, I think, in creating environments that optimise um, the educational experience. But it does strike me that design is really effective only in so far as it's constant with the models of teaching and learning that we want to employ that are desirable in our schools, and only insofar as both are effectively articulating the vision that lies at the heart of the school itself. And a good example comes out of what was talked about first thing this morning um, with Erica, which is that design, like the assessment regime that we choose within limits, like the curriculum framework, like policies around acceptable use for ICT, all of these, these things should be modelling the behaviours that we, as a school or a group of schools, want to encourage in our pupils. And those behaviours might be around the balance between security, uh, comfort and safeguarding with risk-taking and challenge. The idea of a low-threat, high-challenge balance and regime. How does design link to and articulate that? I think is the thing that really was going through my mind this morning when... Um, we were seeing that those great examples early on. The problem is that many of the immediate formal teaching environments, the classrooms that we, we, we have available, were themselves, are themselves a, a product of the past, as we've seen. They've been inherited from a time when they were being calibrated for a very different kind of teaching and learning. 
And we, we adapt them and we use them, but we are living with a lag time effect. It's a challenge. Classrooms, in many cases, were built for the formal transmission of knowledge from one to many, with everyone facing the front. And individuals, no matter how closely they are working together in a physical space, are very much working alone. They're being given to do work alone and they're being assessed as individuals, as freestanding individuals. Learning in boxes, it seems to me, is a good way of describing the connection between design and pedagogy, because in many senses we're talking about spatial boxes and also timetable boxes within a compartmentalised curriculum. And I think that has two implications that we often worry about and consider in the way that we design curriculum as well as design spaces. And that is that there is a danger that for many of our pupils, as well as our colleagues, learning physics means learning physics in a physics lab. And that has two spin-off implications that we ought to think about, I think. One is that, what are the implications there for the status of stuff picked up outside the physics lab that, that might be relevant to physics? How does independent learning fit in with this concept that really the formal learning is really important, it's the only important thing? And the other issue that arises, I think, is about transferability of skills. And I mean, I've had this mentioned by a number of colleagues in, 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 in this room, an issue around sometimes the, the, the really able pupils who find it difficult to transfer from one discipline to another. So the, the, the pupil who goes into a physics lab and doesn't bring their maths in with them, because they were, it was learnt in another box, in another space, in a different time in the timetable. So there are lots of links, I think, between design and curriculum that we could be thinking about. And we're very used to talking about pedagogy in a very mixed and varied way. And we're very used to seeing great examples in our schools of ways in which teachers are doing lots of different things. They're not multitasking, but they're serially tasking within a classroom. They're acting not just as presenter, but as instructor, as consultant, as participant, as facilitator. And it's that mix that gives teaching its vibrancy and its variety, and we're very used to that. But we've got to see learning spaces, no less than teaching methods, as taking account of that need for variety, and the need, the need to take account of the fact that pupils, as we heard this morning, learn in very different ways. We're used to that in pedagogy. Dealing with design in the same way is a real challenge, because today's learners create as well as consume, or expect it. Today's learners are active participants and collaborate in their learning. They don't recognise a distinction between formal and informal learning. And today's learning the pedagogy that our teachers practice tries to capture that, that very spirit, by being inquiry-based, discursive, problem-focused, ICT-enabled in its best examples. So what we're thinking about, I guess, this afternoon is the third box, which is how today's spaces need to be equally smart and flexible. That link between pedagogy and design that is implicit in everything that's been discussed really, I think, today, what should classroom learning actually be about if it's only part of the broader picture? And there's a, a book that I think is going to be published in about a month's time, but there's a lot of discussion, um, if you can believe it, there's a lot of discussion about it, called Flip Your Classroom. And it's around trying to define what it is legitimately we should privilege the classroom for. What kind of learning cannot be done better elsewhere? Sort of silent reading and comprehension exercises within a classroom doesn't seem the best way of using time. And you don't see a lot of that in GDSD schools. So this is very consonant with the sorts of things that we're trying to promote within schools uh, represented here. So not all learning is classroom learning. It would be useful to, to, to think about the extent to which our spaces, our formal spaces, can be mapped onto sort of concepts of how we imagine teaching and learning taking place in in ways other than the immediately formal. And one of the quite interesting um, sort of breakdowns that, that I've seen is where, this applies not just to, to junior schools, <coughs> schools too, the concept of um, sort of mythical ways of learning, traditional ways of learning, representing the campfire, for instance, as the time when, and the space when you're listening, learning from experts, absorbing information, the sort of thing that we might expect to be taking place formally in a classroom. And it's quite an attractive idea, although to be fair, 
If I was that age, faced with someone dressed like that, I'd be quite scared. <laughs> there, might, there must be some safeguarding issues. <laughs> The watering hole is more difficult to fix in terms of what the space looks like because it, the watering hole involves informal learning, collaboration, discussion, creating meaning in that sort of discursive environment. And the cave, that's an unfortunate term, but the cave is where you do independent study and reflection. And Erica's term, the cloister, I think, is, is far preferable education than, than the cave. Go to your cave. <laughs> There's a fourth one, and that's not representative, but the mountain top. The place and the time when the pupil gets to present, gets to show what they know um, in assemblies or in a formal environment within the context of the school. So thinking in terms of all learning spaces, all spaces being learning spaces, a quote from a recent study, students are learning collaboratively through a vast array of informal learning spaces both on and off campus. I just want to refer to two things that... Um, came out from MIT in a recent part in the last few years. There was a book recently called Hanging Out, Messing Around and Geeking Out from some academics at MIT. It was referred to obliquely in the TES about three weeks ago. So it, I think we can assume it's immediately not cool anymore, but I'll, I'll plow on. But basically they define three genres of participation that have digital and sort of real um, physical analogues. The pupils adolescents tend to have three modes of participating. One's hanging out, this sort of development of peer-centred social networks, both real and virtual. Um, messing about, a more intensive engagement with digital media, so that might involve increasingly sort of using search engines, real individual research. And then there's geeking out, an intense engagement and development of expertise. And I wonder the extent to which we can successfully map our curriculum and our learning spaces into the opportunities to be in more than one of those um, genres of participation. And the last um, reference I would give to this of MIT experience in recent years. At MIT, there was a there was some there was some consultation done with students about their um, their feedback on learning and the way that learning was done in higher education and remains done as the staples of the lecture. And, and one said that. Um, learning through formal lectures was like trying to take a drink from a high-pressure hose. <laughs> Limited in effect. And so what MIT did, among other things, was to try to work out spaces that would represent this breakdown of a formal and informal learning environment. Now, they developed this concept of the, of, of, of the student street, a kind of liminal zone of mixed, indeterminate use, where at any one place, at any one time, there might be movement, it's... It's a series of passageways, after all. Eating, studying, hanging out. There wasn't this distinction between any of those activities. They were all allowed to be going on. And much the way that Erica described happening at, that we saw at Putney yesterday, no matter how you design them, pupils will make their own judgments about how to use them. And it's trying to give the maximum flexibility in that, in that sort of um, area. So my concern, I suppose, at this stage is with the excitement I've got from the, the, the morning's discussions has been around the extent to which a lot of this discussion around physical design is also a discussion about how it links with ways of thinking, ways of being with our, um, our pupil charges. Um, I'd now just like to look at some kind of practical examples of how we can inform the brief and how we can think about our spaces and how that, kind of, how that works in, in reality. Um, and what I'd like to start off with is the entrance to a school, um, which I think is often a very kind of forgotten area of the school, um, but incredibly important. It's the front door. It's the first thing that people see, and it should absolutely be the hub and the heart of the school. Um, so the role of entrance is vital, and I would argue that if it's little more than an imposing portal to the school or a spacious circulation route, then opportunities have been lost. It can form the heart of the school and establish a culture of learning and support which reflects the school's vision. And it can bring together in one space the range of facilities on which learners depend and demonstrate effective use of up-to-date communication and information technologies. So, you know, you know our, our reception areas, although often very welcoming, are very static. Um, and actually, you could have a very technology-rich environment. You could have touch screen technology. We could stream 
educational happenings into the into the entrance. So it becomes a real selling point. It really, it really kind of portrays the vision of the school and shows people what the school's about. And I think that's a really important area that we, as I say, we often we often overlook. It's a very functional area, but it's very often not an inspiring area. If we move on to transitions, um, most of our building stock is quite aged, and uh, there's often a feeling that it's very rigid, and it is very rigid, but only if you look at the walls and not the spaces, um, and the walls should never be a barrier. And actually what's always interesting is we have this perception that learning happens in a classroom. Learning should happen throughout the building. And actually the way that you move through a building and the transition areas are just as important as the, as the, the learning spaces that we have for specific subjects. So transitional spaces can make the most of time between activities or classes. To do this, the nature of circulation spaces need to change to become ad hoc workspaces. These transitional spaces can encourage serendipitous encounters, places to settle and linger, and informal learning spaces, which I know probably fills some people with dread. Um, but they could be fascinating spaces. That's how life is. You know, you, you go through life and you experience things. Why are our corridors just means to an end and not actually a really, a, a really good journey in themselves? Um, the significance of incidental learning making in school in learning makes school infrastructure transparent and brings a community sense and teaches young people the workings of the real world. Technology, I know we're saying technology is a word that we shouldn't really be using anymore, but um, it connects learners with each other. Information and the outside world personalises learning and contributes to the flexibility of spaces provided. Connectivity to internet and power makes learning visible and meaningful. The importance of connectivity cannot be underestimated as it shapes where learners will position themselves and how flexible they will make themselves. And I think these examples are really interesting. So it's actually making more of the, of the physical space within the school. It's, it's about the, the spaces in between which are so important. Um, the next thing I'd, I'd, I'd like to go into kind of real kind of specifics. Um, and what I'd like to say is that well-designed learning spaces have a motivational effect. We all know that. Learning areas infused with natural light can provide an environment that is easy and pleasurable to work in. Wireless connectivity with a brightly lit atrium, learning cafe or open plan social area will encourage engagement in learning and instill a desire to continue activities beyond timetable classes. And one of the things I think we have to always be mindful of is, is to be very flexible in our spaces. Uh, and one of the ways that we can do that is through furniture. Furniture plays a significant role in enabling learning, a learning environment to be flexible. Learners can be reluctant to change an inherited configuration, even when self-management of the space is encouraged. So they are likely to adopt the mode of learning signalled by the existing layout and type of furniture. Combinations of furniture or movable chairs and desks, as this shows, can unlock and unlock most constrained spaces. And I think it's interesting here that using similar furniture inside and outside of classrooms just blurs the boundaries between where the, where the learning environments are. So that thing, I think that's something that's very easy. It's a very easy one in our schools to think about how we furnish the schools. Future-proofing is always a, it's a buzzword, but it's something that's incredibly important. And I think you know, what we have to think about is how we can enable our spaces to be reallocated and reconfigured. Considering the technological requirements at the early stages of planning will ensure that maximum benefit can be obtained from the investment. And that's really key. So often, um, you know, our experiences are that we think about the building and then we worry about where we're going to put the IT. And um, that's really missing the point and the opportunity. Uh, so thinking about those things early will provide the opportunity to unlock the potential of spaces. And research studies have shown that flexible spaces together with appropriate technology create conditions for innovation, creativity and confidence for both teachers and learners. So it's an incredibly, incredibly important aspect to consider. And I think it's really interesting, these, these photos are quite interesting in that they are, there are normal kind of classroom sizes and shapes, but the furniture makes them feel very, very different. Um, and I can't imagine that there's many of our schools that have this kind of concept of this idea of the furniture, we're very used to our very static desks, our little square desks that we kind of keep in a very regimented and, and you know, kind of static fashion. Um, and we can take those same 
square rooms that make them feel incredibly different, um, and I think that's very, very important. The other thing I would say uh, when thinking about a brief, when thinking about investment, is to be bold and creative. That's incredibly important. Um, take a risk. It's only a building. We can change it. Um, people are so bound by walls and boundaries, and you know most buildings can be adapted. It's just about how you think about them. So try something out. We can always come back and do something different. Um, and I think what I'd urge is to say there are no rules on what a school should look like or the types of spaces it should contain. I think we have this real perception of this is how a school looks. Who knows how a school looks? It's about us thinking how we'd love a school to look. <coughs> And I'd say try something different. It doesn't always need to be defined. Um, you don't need always to be sure how a space will be used. You can just create the opportunity for things to happen. And I think that's an incredible, powerful way of looking at a building and something I think we should all, you know, when we're looking at our investment programmes, this is something that we should really be, be grasping onto and thinking about. If we're to foster flexible, creative and adaptable <coughs> minds, we need to look more critically at the extent to which learning space designs promote innovative ways of thinking. So if you put children in a box, it's very, very difficult for them to break out of that box. The other thing I would say is, is to think about how we can make the, the spaces very supportive to develop the potential of learners. And learners have been shown to benefit academically from their peers. And so open plan and formal learning areas provide individualised learning environments which also support collaborative activities and they can often be created from previously underutilised spaces. So this is going very much back to the transitional spaces. There's so much potential in our buildings, we just need to unlock it. And it's having the mindset to do that. Thank you very much. Kevin. So, to finish, um, on an opportunity as well as a challenge, I guess, because we've been talking generically about what <coughs> good learning spaces look like. Um, and most of us um, have been thinking at the same time about what good learning spaces look like for girls and whether that's different. I think one of the experiences of a lot of the sort of building schools for the future programmes in different parts of Europe um, has shown us is that where it's where these new very innovative approaches to designing schools have worked best is where research suggests where pupil autonomy that often goes with those sorts of designs is associated with a pupil body that is well motivated usually on the able side able end of the spectrum well supported with lots of cultural capital. And it 